not studying. It's an avoidance kind of, or an escape kind of thing. Now, how do you find the positive consequences which can take the place of these aversive techniques? That is the whole art of, of managing a classroom, designing instructional materials, and progress is, is being made. The, the ordinary positive reinforcers of, of, of marks, grades, graduation, and so on, prizes, honors, medals, and all of that, the contingencies are terrible. They're, those things are not contingent on the behavior that you really want to set up. But uh, you can redesign them and, and, uh, and make progress. You make the point that not everyone can achieve the highest levels and get the, the kudos, the medals, and prizes, which uh, depend upon that. But if you redesign a, a course of instruction, as, for example, uh, the, the system that Fred Keller has designed for reorganizing a college course, then you can take progress through the course as your only examination. There's no final examination. You, you can't get through the course unless you know it because of the way it's designed. And you take a, an ordinary class with a distribution of IQs, whatever you want to call them these days, and some will breeze through this course and reach the end quickly and get the A and move on to something else. Others will move more slowly, impressed by the end of a the term they've only got halfway through. But you don't give them a C, you don't give them anything, come back and take the rest of it next term and you get an A too. And if the material is, is within the range of the population you've already selected for this kind of instruction, then you, everyone, everyone succeeds and everyone must have prizes as in Alice in Wonderland. And in your system, this person would be rewarded by a success and, a, and acquire in the process a desire to learn more on his own. Well, I don't know about the desire to learn more. What he has discovered is that he can improve. He can acquire behavior which makes him more effective. And that acquisition is, is itself reinforcing. And he's unlikely to go on if the opportunity presents itself with the same kind of instruction. He'll go on and do more of it and acquire, acquire more, and uh, if you don't watch out, he'll, he'll try to stay too long in your school, and, uh, and you'll have to graduate him forcibly. What do you mean that our schools are really using methods of aversive control? Well, I mean, why does, a, why does a child come to school in the morning? Well, there are truant officers who'll go after him if he doesn't. Now, we've given up on that. There are thousands of children in big cities who don't, don't bother going to school. But that was at one time. You know, when you get to school, why do you sit in your place? Well, you'll be sent to the principal for a talking to, or in, in course, many schools are now calling for the return of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the birch who get physically punished. Uh, I know schools in this, in this country where if you don't bring your homework in, you hold out your hand and get slapped with the ruler. Now, that can be reversed. Uh, it's such a simple thing to do. I had a very interesting conversation with a with a, a young girl who teaches in the sixth grade in a southern city. She's black, and she teaches mostly black students, and she had this trouble. They wouldn't come in with the homework, and the family wasn't likely to induce them to do their homework. They wouldn't bother doing the work in the classroom. So she had read something that I had written and uh, decided to try it out. What she did was to bring in, at the beginning of the week, a little prize which she would put up on the shelf where the kids could see it. It might be, say, a transistor radio or something like that. It cost her five or ten dollars, not any more than that. And then she'd tell the, the children that on Friday afternoon there would be a drawing and someone would get this. And she had a, a jar there. And whenever you brought your homework in, you could write your name on a ticket and drop it in the jar. And whenever you did your assignment during the day, you got the arithmetic problems, when you finished, if they were right, you could write your name and drop it in the jar. And Friday afternoon, there would be a drawing, and uh, someone would get this. And she said it changed her life completely. She was glad to pay 5 or $10 a week for this, because it was so simple. They all brought their homework in. They all sat down and got their work done, you see. And uh, now you say, oh, well, wait a minute, that's not fair, that you're bribing them, and so on. But they're doing their work, you see, and they can begin to get the natural consequences of being more competent than their brothers and sisters who have been in somebody else's class and haven't had the advantages of, this, uh, of these economic incentives. I would justify that. I'd, you say, well, that's not the natural reason for doing arithmetic, but neither is it natural to, to avoid punishment to do arithmetic, you see. And the, then, as a matter of fact, there is no natural 
reward and learn the multiplication table. Uh, but if you program it the right way so you can learn it easily, you get some satisfaction out of that, and eventually you get a job where you have to multiply and divide, and uh, then is when you begin to get the natural reinforcers. But the, the school must set up arbitrary, spurious reinforcers to get the behavior there so that it can begin to reach uh, natural reinforcers. What are the consequences of using the kinds of adversive reinforcers that schools currently do? What are the byproducts of this Well, kind that's, of that's the trouble. You can, you can, of course, fortunately for us all, I suppose, because the human race would hardly be where it is now if schools hadn't been severely punitive in the past. The, the birds ride up on the wall up there and you do this or else. And, of course, people do learn under those contingencies, but they also tend to play truant, to escape from this when they can, or to drop out as soon as they're able to legally, or to forget it all as fast as they possibly can, or to vandalize, to attack teachers, to break windows in schools, or just to fall into a state of apathy and do nothing. These are all byproducts of aversive control. And although they may have learned something, they're not going to... Uh, have very much interest in supporting education in the future. What are the problems of the transition between, for a teacher being really a negative reinforcer, a part of a punitive system, what are the transition problems in becoming part of a positive reinforcing system? Well, strange as it may seem, they're not really very difficult. I've seen disrupted classrooms straighten out in a week or two. And the teacher discovers that actually he or she has been reinforcing the very behaviors that have been causing trouble. And they learn how to stop that. Could you give an example? Well, for example, uh, there's a general principle that leave well enough alone. Here's so-and-so over here and he's doing his work, so don't go near him. If you go near him, he'll start causing trouble. So what you do is you go and, and pay attention to those who are causing trouble, and, and the tension is reinforcing. So you really, in, you really reinforce people for causing trouble. And you fail to reinforce people for sitting quietly and getting their work done. Now, the thing to do is to pick out those children who are doing what you want them to do, and they're the ones you should go and, and talk to and give a word to or something of that kind and avoid reinforcing the, the troublemakers as much as possible. Another principle is um, it's very commonly practiced and commonly recommended. If you see a child starting to get into trouble, distract his attention. Well, now, what is distraction? Distraction is something reinforcing. So when you distract the attention of a troublemaker, you're reinforcing his troublemaking. You have to sense these things and to realize what, what you're doing. You've written that the technology that you've been identified with is essentially neutral, and that the, it's the uses to which it put, um, how within a school can you determine the uses to, to which it's put? How can parents not feel, for example, that the school is uh, somehow doing things to their children that they don't want done? Or let me phrase that another way. As a parent, I would be leery of having people whose values I wasn't sure I agreed with having powerful tools at their disposal to affect uh, my children. Or this is a time in our country when middle-class values are under unprecedented attack. The major purveyors of those middle-class values uh, are teachers in the school system yeah. within the context of the school. Um, well, this raises the, the question which is bound to be raised if you suppose that education is effective. If it's not effective, then you can get out of all of this. You don't worry about what is happening because you know nothing's going to be mm -hmm. done. But if you could imagine a very powerful educational technology, which I think is available if it were to be used, then you do want to go back and look at these value questions. And uh, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I don't particularly like uh, present culture. And I've, uh, in Walden, too, I describe what it seems to me an alternative uh, culture. And I don't blame young people today for saying, no, I'm not going to take what you're handing me. I don't like that. I'm going to try something of my own. And I think that should be done. In general, in this country, we have profited from a certain diversity. 
You send your children to parochial schools, they get one kind of thing. You send them to big city schools, they get another. You send them to small upper-class private schools, uh, then they 